Okay, this is chapter 13.2, the second part of it. We're going to talk about the ideal gas law and what that is and how to use it. Um, the ideal gas particles occupy a negligible volume, that means hardly any volume, and are far enough apart to exert minimal attraction or repulsive forces on each other. So they don't attract, they don't repel, they don't interact with each other very much. Um, to get the combined gas law, it's the ideal gas law. That's the combined gas law, right? We've been working with that. And we know that that pressure times the volume divided by the temperature in Kelvin is a constant. Right? That's what we use on the ideal gas law. Um, all the gas laws we've learned so far can be combined into a single equation called the ideal gas law. And the mathematical relationship among pressure, volume, temperature, and, and we're going to introduce the number of moles on the gas, okay? And it looks like this. The ideal gas law is the pressure times the volume equals N, which is the number of moles. And this constant is R. It's a constant that we use to make all the numbers come out to be the right units and the right um, amounts that we want. So this doesn't change. It, it very, well, it changes depending on what pressure you're using, but it, if you're using atmospheres, it's always the same for atmospheres. If you're using the kilopascals, it's always the same for that. And so this is the classic chemical equation. PV equals NRT is how, if you talk to your parents about chemistry, this is probably what, about the only thing they remember. Oh, yeah, PV equals NRT. Yeah, okay, well, so N is the number of moles. R is just a constant. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And the pressure and the volume are what we've been dealing with so far. The temperature is still in kelvins. So the ideal gas law, so we can introduce this concept of the pressure and the volume depend on the amount of stuff we have, right, and the temperature and the volume. So we've introduced and one more variable here, the amount of stuff, the amount of moles we have in a gas. Okay, so the ideal gas constant, the one we use the most often, is with atmospheres, and it's 0 0.821. That's kind of a rounded number. It's not, you know, if we, I'll show you how to get that number in a second. And the ideal gas laws describes the physical behavior of an ideal gas in terms of pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. Well, of course, there's really no such thing as an ideal gas, but most of the gases we have, they behave like an ideal gas at normal temperatures and pressures that we deal with them. Okay, so they behave enough like an ideal gas that we can use this, use this to work with. So this constant R that they're talking about, the PV over NT, that's R. Okay, so if we took the pressure and the volume of one mole, if we took, you know, standard temperature and pressure, one atmosphere, 22.4 liters divided by 273 Kelvin, that's standard temperature and pressure for one mole, we would come up with this number, the 0 0.821. Okay, so that's where they get that number. This is the standard temperature and pressure. Plug those numbers in here and you'll get R. Okay, but it's a constant. It doesn't matter which numbers we use, and we change the pressure, the temperature, the volume, even the number of moles is still going to be a constant amount. Okay, so that's what we've that's what we're working with here. These are the other units of R. Um, if you're using kilopascals, that's the number. If you're using milligrams of mercury or torrs, as it's sometimes called. That's the number you have to use. So it just depends on what pressure number you're using. And most of the time, we're just going to be using atmospheres. So we're going to be using this number, the 0.0821. Okay, so a practice problem here. What's the pressure in atmospheres exerted by half, half a mole of a sample of nitrogen gas in a 10-liter container at this temperature? Okay, so we have the volume. We have the temperature, we have moles, and we want to know what the pressure is. Okay, so we have we have three out of our four variables here. We're trying to find the one we don't know. Okay, so we have V, we have N, we have T, and we have P. Okay, so notice we don't have the, the before and after like we did on the ideal gas law. We just have one of each of these things, and we're trying to figure out the one that they didn't give us. Right? We have four variables, one constant, they gave us three of the variables and left us to figure out what the other variable was. Okay, so the solution is to, to take the PV equals NRT, 
and since we're trying to find the pressure, we would just divide the NRT divided by V, and we get this. So the number of moles times the gas constant R times the temperature in Kelvin divided by the volume that they gave us in the problem. That's going to be equal our P, or pressure in atmospheres. Okay, so we plug all those in. If we put half a mole, the R is the constant, 298 Kelvin, and divided by 10, that was the, they gave us was the, uh, the volume, we get 1.22 atmospheres. So that's the pressure in that container. At that many moles of gas, that temperature, that pressure, that's what we would get. I mean, that volume, that's what we would get. Okay, so the other things that sometimes they do is they, um, you can, since the number of moles here, PV equals NRT, we can do a substitution, right? The number of moles equals the, the mass in grams, right, divided by the molar mass, that's the capital M. Okay, so that's all they did here is they go, okay, well, 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 now we're just doing it, we're doing a substitution here. Instead of number of moles, we're taking the mass number, so, so they give you a mass of something. And then they say, oh, you, you know, how many grams of whatever gas it is. Well, we can still use this thing, we can still use this because we can figure out that PV equals the mass in grams over the molar mass. Okay, that's just the same as N. Okay, so sometimes you might have a problem like that. And if you want to figure out the molar mass of the gas, sometimes that's, you would want to do that to, to figure out what kind of gas we're dealing with. If you did an experiment and you got the weight and, you know, the temperature, the pressure, the volume, but you don't know what kind it is because all the gases look the same. So this is one way you can figure out what it is. You can figure out the molar weight of that gas and say, oh, well, that's carbon dioxide or that's oxygen or that's whatever it is. You could do it that way. Density in the ideal gas law, same kind of thing with um, we had before. We do a substitution. The mass over the volume, that is what density is. The mass divided by volume, that's the definition of density. So we could take this M and the V here from this molar um, equation we had on the other one and put a D in there. So the molar mass, if we know the density of the gas, we can figure out that it's the, you know, the constant times the temperature divided by the pressure. So we can have one, um, one less variable, the volume, to, to uh, worry about there. So you may have a problem where you have density in the problem. So that's, and you can rearrange this, you know, any way you want with the molar mass. If they, if they give you the density and you want to find the temperature, a certain pressure, you can rearrange these variables to get whatever you need to solve. So on that, or you can figure out the density, right? That's sometimes that's what we want to do too. If we know the molar mass, we know the pressure, the temperature, we could figure out the density of whatever material or whatever gas we're dealing with. Okay, so real versus ideal gases, some of the things that are the same and some of the are different. So ideal gases follow the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory, right? They're all bounce around, any elastic, I mean, elastic collisions, they don't, um, interact with each other, they're far apart, and these are the things that ideal gases experience. There's no intermolecular force, attractive or repulsive forces between the particles or containers, so they're not stuck to each other or the containers. They're in constant random motion, and the, all the collisions are perfectly elastic. They don't lose any energy colliding into each other or into the walls. Okay. So like I said at the beginning, no gas is truly ideal under all these conditions, but most behave as ideal gases for the amount of measurements we can do under a wide range of temperatures and pressures. And on this next slide, we're going to go through what, how they don't, okay? So the real gases deviate most from ideal gases at high pressures. They don't act like ideal gases at high pressures or at low temperatures when, they, when they're not bouncing around very fast or at very high pressures. That's when they don't act like an ideal gas. Also, polar molecules have enough attractive forces that they don't act like ideal gases. Um, so polar gases do not behave as ideal gases because of that attractive force. And especially if they're large, and large nonpolar gas molecules occupy more space and deviate more from ideal gases. So these would be um, like the, uh, 
hydrocarbon gases that are, are large, have a lot of particles on them, they occupy more space, and they don't quite act like ideal gases. So those are, these two last two slides were ones that, what the ideal gas assumptions were, and what they would, what the variations are. High pressures, low temperatures, polar molecules, polar gases, and large nonpolar gas molecules don't act like that. Okay, so that's the um, end of this video. Answer the questions on the form below, and I'll see you guys in class tomorrow.